with someone about Jenkins. So uh, if, if, you, if you find yourself talking you know, with a manager or a developer, sysadmin, anybody about Jenkins, uh, I hope that you have you know, some common language. Um, talk just briefly about how to install and manage Jenkins. Again, uh, don't expect people to come out of this talk with, oh yeah, I, I'm a Jenkins admin now, but um, just give you a quick little preview, um, walk through some things. Also want to talk about uh, Jenkins best practices. So, so really, uh, I want to give some advice so that if you're getting started with Jenkins and you decide, you know, this is something you want to pursue, uh, just some best practices. So first, um, a, a little bit about me. So my name is Kevin Howell. I uh, can be reached at khowell.com or my personal email is kevin at uh, kahowell.net. Either of those will work to reach me. Um, I've got my GitHub URL there. I have uh, a web page, but I, I don't keep a lot of stuff on there. But one thing I am posting is this presentation. So if you want to go back and, and uh, see it again or, or want to see my speaker notes, um, they, they'll be ex accessible from there. Um, so, so I've been with Red Hat um, for a little over five years now. Uh, I am a Red Hat certified architect and uh, my day job. I work as a senior software engineer in the Red Hat Satellite 6 group. Um, I'm currently the tech lead for a group that works on subscription management as part of uh, Satellite 6. Um, and, and there are a couple projects associated with that. Um, if you hear me say Candlepin or Subscription Manager, uh, those are two of those projects. So uh, first, I'd like to define what, what is Jenkins. So first of all, if anyone has heard the term Hudson, or if you've used Hudson in the past, um, that was the project that, that Jenkins originally um, you know, sort of started from. It was another one of those uh, projects that you know, Oracle had an involvement, and of course there's a fork. And Jenkins is the fork that is the more community maintained fork. I, I believe Oracle still maintains Hudson, but you won't hear people talking about Hudson much uh, anymore. Um, so, so first of all, Jenkins is a widely used open source automation server. I say widely used because um, I, I've seen tons and tons of job postings for, for different industries. You know, uh, gaming industry uses it. Uh, obviously, software industry. Uh, I, I would go as far as, as to say it's probably the sort of default de facto automation server. Uh, the most obvious use of Jenkins and sort of the thing that it sort of started out um, really being used for is to build and test software. Um, so, so, so people really think uh, continuous integration. Um, but um, something that I want folks to take away from this is that Jenkins can be used as a general purpose uh, tool for, for giving you a central way to, to run your tasks. So, you know, it's a centrally accessible web interface that, that you can use to both trigger and then monitor um, automation. Um, another important aspect of Jenkins is that Jenkins functionality is provided by a uh, community of plugins. So um, this talk, I won't go into too much detail about a lot of different plugins, but, but it's important to note that if there's something that you're trying to do, uh, it's worth looking to see if there are plugins that, that will support you. Um, because it, it's kind of, you have some basic building blocks and you can do a lot with those, um, but, but sometimes plugins will give you easier ways of, of doing what you're trying to accomplish. Um, I, I think though, I, I wanna focus on just core Jenkins because you might find yourself in an environment where you don't have a lot of control over what plugins uh, you, you're allowed to install, or you know, due to security, or just you, you might be working on a server that you don't have uh, access to do that. Um, so, so first of all, Jenkins runs anywhere that Java runs. So this means Linux, Windows, Mac, um, on Linux, you know, all the, the popular flavors. So, so there are packages for RHEL, 
CentOS, Fedora, OpenSUSE, so it's a, um, Ubuntu, Debian, and uh, you, you can run Jenkins as a container. Uh, there, there is a supported container image for that. When I say supported, I mean by the community, not officially supported in any capacity as far as I know. Um, and then there, for Windows, there's an installer. Uh, for, for Mac OS, I assume something similar, but uh, less experience with that personally. Um, so for, for Jenkins installation, as, as I mentioned, there are packages available for all the various Linux distros. Um, another option is to run a VM image. So uh, I, there are some vendors out there, such as uh, I think Bitnami has an image for Jenkins that you can just spin up on your um, infrastructure provider of choice, uh, be that you know Amazon or or Google Cloud, uh, um, Google, or, or Azure. Um, or another option that might be compelling to you is, is you could build a customized image uh, that runs Jenkins using a tool like Packer.io. Uh, and as I mentioned, you can also run Jenkins as a container image. Uh, that's quite useful. Uh, and there, there are a few flavors of this. Uh, there, there is a general Jenkins community uh, image that is docker.io slash library slash Jenkins. Uh, and then um, quick plug uh, for, for Red Hat, uh, OpenShift has a Jenkins image that you, that you can run as part of OpenShift. And that has some integrations with OpenShift. And I think you'll find in general in an environment um, it's advantageous to have a Jenkins setup that has plugins that are geared towards whatever you're trying to uh, really orchestrate. So uh, I'm not going to talk through really uh, installation because I think uh, the Jenkins documentation does a great job of telling you how you really install it. It's, it's really not much more than installing a package and then starting a service. Uh, once you start that service, uh, it has a web interface that runs on port 8080. Um, so, so I'm showing here, I'll, I'll point out a few things. Um, so the first is, and, and I, I realize that text is a little hard to read, um, but there are menu items on the left. Uh, the first one is new item. So this is the entry point for you to create uh, new automation to run in Jenkins, and, and I'll, I'll go into detail about that in a moment. Um, and then there, the other big one I wanted to point out was there's a manage Jenkins, and this is if you have administrative access to that Jenkins server, how you can uh, install plugins, um, how you can configure security, how you can add credentials. Uh, I actually would like to show that really quick. So, like I said, it's a, a web app, so I, I've just got a standard, you know, browser window up here. Uh, as I mentioned, new item is used to create jobs or pipelines, and like I said, I'll get into that later, but I wanted to show a few things under the management page. So, you can define users. Uh, you can do things like integrate with LDAP. Uh, and use groups to constrain who is able to do certain things in Jenkins. Uh, you can, as I mentioned, add credentials. This is, think, username and password or SSH key. And these are really useful. I'm going to shrink the screen just a touch. Uh, So you can enter, like I said, a username and password. You can um, include files. So you might do, for example, like I said, an SSH key. Uh, and, and those are useful if you, if you anticipate writing some automation that uh, needs to reach out to other systems. You know, if, you, if, you, if some of your automation might involve uh, SSHing into machines and kicking off commands um, or you know, hitting APIs. This is the, the place where you're going to want to store the, the secrets that you're using to access the services. 
Um, the other thing I did want to show really quickly is I mentioned plugins. So if you go to this, the plugin management page in Jenkins, if you go to available, there is a slew of, of packages. And uh, so for example, if, I'm, if I do a search for Azure, you'll see there are 51 matches for, for Azure related plugins. And in general, any technology that, that uh, most technologies that, that you you know would think of, especially ones that, that are that are more common, like the cloud providers, they have a lot of plugins available. Some of these are maintained by community members. Some of them are have a little bit more direct involvement uh, from the cloud providers themselves. Um, but but the big thing here is this is how you typically will install plugins and get a little bit more first class support for um, for those services. So um, another aspect, uh, or, or rather a central aspect of Jenkins uh, for understanding how things kind of work is that Jenkins has this concept of a node. And a node is just a system that Jenkins is using to execute tasks. So you might create set different nodes for different tasks, so you might have a node that is used for doing Linux builds. You might have a node that's used for doing Windows builds. Um, the important thing here is uh, nodes do a lot for you in terms of, um, they, they provide a lot of different things. So, so first one, security is, uh, Having Jenkins run automation on a separate system means that if that system gets compromised, you're not compromising your entire automation server. Um, stability, uh, having that automation code being run on a separate machine, separate system, means that the, the automation server itself uh, is not using a lot of resources and and do, doesn't suffer in terms of. Uh, SLA uh, in terms of you know latency on the pages and things like that. It provides isolation in that uh, you can have a lot of different jobs running at once on different systems, and again, you know, in terms of resources, have that spread out. And uh, what I hinted at a moment ago, um, because you can create no nodes on systems of different types, you can uh, do some cross-platform automation. So one thing that we use this for in uh, Subscription Manager, we, we build Subscription Manager for several Linux distros, including uh, OpenSUSE, and we can test against OpenSUSE and also test against uh, RHEL family systems, uh, all from the same automation server. So there, there are many types of Jenkins nodes, and, I th and which one you use sort of just depends on your environment. Um, so the, the first two sort of obvious ones are the Jenkins master itself can be used as a node. So if, if you're doing some experimentation, this it's a decent way to sort of just get started, uh, to just let the Jenkins server also run some of the scripts. It's, it's bad practice in the long run, um, but it's, it's an option. Um, the other really common sort of baseline node type is to set up Jenkins to SSH to another machine. Uh, so that can be bare metal or provisioned, however uh, you might think to provision that machine. Uh, but as long as it's got Java installed, uh, Jenkins can uh, util utilize that as a node. Uh, there are other options for um, doing uh, scaling up and down on demand. Uh, so if you're using OpenStack, there's a plugin for that. Uh, if you're using Cloud Provider, there are plugins for, for those to, to scale up and down resources. So bring up a uh, compute resource, use it for your automation, and then tear it down when, when you no longer have automation running on that. Uh, and then if you are, if you're using containers heavily in your environment, uh, you can provision and deprovision um, containers or pods 
on a specific system. So you can say, this is my Kubernetes master. I'd like to uh, execute some automation inside that Kubernetes cluster and utilize that uh, for, for your nodes. Uh, another concept is, is the job. So the job is, is what was implemented originally in Jenkins. Uh, so the freestyle job is, is the more, the, the longer, more canonical uh, term for it. Um, and, and jobs are really, they're, they're a pretty simple object. They, they have a few components. Um, one is that they have configuration. So they have things like what Git repo are, are you connecting to? Uh, and it, the, this really ties into using Jenkins for continuous integration. So you might uh, set your Git repo to the, the code of the application that you're trying to, to build and test. And uh, there, there are other things in there. There's retention policies for that job, uh, parameters on the job. And uh, I think a big, really useful one is uh, there's a description field. And uh, I recommend that if you create freestyle jobs, uh, that, that you fill in the description for who, whoever uh, you know, inherits that or uses that, because the, that's, your, that's your way of documenting the job to others. There are triggers which are how the job is run. Um, a couple of useful ones, if you connect it to a uh, source control uh, system, then you can trigger on things like git pushes. Uh, there's also a cron-like scheduler as a, as a trigger, so you can say, I want to run a job at 3 a.m. every night. Um, and so you can use Jenkins as sort of a centralized cron server. Uh, there are also um, build actions is, is where you actually define what the job should be doing. Um, so, so the baseline uh, I would recommend is, is shell scripts. So if you can write a shell script, you can then take that shell script and run it using Jenkins. Uh, ideally, you know, you keep that shell script also in uh, source control. Um, those build actions can use parameters and they can use credentials. And then finally, there are post-build actions, which are uh, essentially mostly just notifications. Um, so, the, you know, send an email or uh, send a message to IRC or you know whatever your messaging platform of choice is about when the job fails, or you can say you know anytime the job runs. Uh, you can also use post-build actions to chain jobs, uh, so you can have a job kick off another job. So this is the interface that, that you'll see in the web UI uh, for a freestyle job. You can kind of see there, there are uh, sections there for each of the items that I mentioned. So there's a section to define general attributes of the job. Here's where the description field is. Uh, they put it up there first and uh, you know it's in your face, so please fill it out. <laughs> um, there's the, the triggers, as I mentioned, the build, and then the post-build actions. So the most basic way of creating the freestyle jobs is to basically fill out this form, and then there's a save button that you can't really see in, in the screenshot, but um, a little bit further down the page, it's a, it's a big, long form <laughs> with a save button at the bottom. Um, something that we started doing, which I think is useful um, but, but, but also requires a little bit more uh, investment in terms of skill, is uh, there is a, a DSL that you can use to create jobs. And so this is really just a way of taking all the same information that you'd put in that UI and uh, putting that into code. Um, so the job DSL is a, a Groovy-based DSL. So... I, I pulled up an example from uh, one of our jobs, um, and I'll, I'll talk through it a little bit. So you can see it defines a name uh, for the job. So this this one, um, it lands in a folder. Um, so you can see there's some variable interpolation there, and I, I sort of omitted that bit. But um, the name of the job is Vagrant Upstream Images. You can see I filled out a description so that uh, folks can kind of understand 
what the intended uses of this job is. So, th so this job builds uh, CentOS, Fedora, and other Vagrant images for subscription manager development. There's a label. This says what um, what node, what type of node the uh, job should run on. There is the, the SEM information. So this this shows that uh, the first thing this job should do is check out this Candlepin Packer repo from GitHub. Uh, and then you can see we're using credentials here. Uh, as I mentioned, when you need to interact with uh, external API or uh, external system, um, credentials is, is the way, way you should be doing that. And then finally, uh, we, we have some steps in here. So, so you can see this, this job doesn't do in, any notification, but um, the, the big thing that we have been doing here, which I would recommend if you uh, if you want to utilize freestyle jobs is uh, read file from workspace allows you to keep uh, the keep your um, build action the shell script part of it actually in a file in a repo rather than having that inlined here which you know is functional but is, is also harder to maintain Uh, the other concept of Jenkins, so freestyle jobs was the original way that people use Jenkins and people would kind of chain them together and they started building out uh, essentially pipelines. The modern way of interacting with Jenkins is um, some, some years ago they added uh, first class support for this concept. Uh, so rather than chaining together jobs, you get, the, you get a way of defining an actual uh, pipeline. So uh, these are also a groovy DSL. Um, so, so you can see uh, it starts with pipeline, uh, and then you have some options around the job. So, so this shows that uh, we have a retention policy of keeping 50, uh, 50 of those instances of the jobs that have run around for history. Uh, again, you see it is set to run on a specific node. And then uh, the big thing here, and this is where the pipelines and the freestyle jobs kind of diverge um, in, in terms of uh, the way that they're architected. Uh, the pipelines define stages, and each of those stages is uh, somewhat independent. So you can rerun an individual stage within a pipeline. Um, and uh, you can see that this pipeline is, uh, this is pretty typical of what you might see for uh, continuous integration. So you get uh, a build that is, you get the project checked out, you get it built, and then you, you get it assembled, and then some of the stages that are omitted, we do some tests and uh, so, some other things. Um, actually, might be helpful to go back to this. So, so you can see we build the project, we run unit tests against it, we run some linting, and then we do some static analysis. Um, so, so all typical kind of continuous integration stuff. And uh, the big thing with, with these uh, pipelines is that if you choose to use pipelines, uh, the, the convention that, that is quite useful is you can create a file called Jenkins file in the repo of the, the code that you are tr trying to automate. And that Jenkins file, uh, just, just by having it set up that way, it, you, you probably noticed in this example pipeline, there was no mention of the SCM being used. Uh, and, and so you have somewhat of a, you know, you have some independence from your, from, from your SCM that way, and then the, the pipeline can really focus on all of the steps that come after the, the code has been checked out. Um, so for Jenkins file, you can see, you know, a lot of you are probably thinking, oh, well, that sounds a lot like a make file. Um, they're obviously trying to, you know, conjure images of that in your head um, through their naming. Um, anyone that's familiar with Travis, um, Travis.yaml is, is a similar concept. 
Um, one piece of advice, so, so I didn't really go into detail um, in, in that last pipeline that I was showing, but that was a pipeline written in the declarative syntax. So there are two syntaxes out there. Um, the declarative one is the one that uh, the Jenkins community is really pushing at this point. Uh, I would advise you try to use that when possible. The other syntax, uh, they call it the scripted syntax. That's more powerful, but it, you're allowed to do plain groovy in the uh, scripted syntax, which, while useful, makes the the pipeline's often harder to maintain consistent, you know, style. Um, and in the declarative uh, syntax, you can always create a, a block, a script block to break out into the scripted syntax. So there's always an escape hatch that, that you can use. Um, as I mentioned before, um, it's, it's, it's very useful to keep the, the scripts that you're actually running, especially if you're writing them as bash scripts or Python scripts. Um, it, it's useful to keep those in the repo. It's useful to, rather than inline commands, especially if you're doing more than, than one command, to, to put those in a script. Uh, this also lets you leverage uh, skills you already have if you know Bash or if you know Python or Ruby or any other scripting language. Um, so, so now I want to talk a little bit about, okay, so, so now with all these concepts, what are some of the things that you can do at Jenkins? So, as I mentioned before, um, Jenkins can be a, a, a central script runner. Uh, so, so this is a good way to share your scripts. You know, you can put them in a repo, and then set up uh, either jobs or pipelines on the Jenkins server uh, as a way of sharing those with others. And sharing can be in terms of development, so others can pull down your Git repo and edit the scripts. It can also be in terms of if you have uh, people that w need to interact with whatever process you've automated, but you don't, you, you either don't trust them or they don't want the access to run the scripts by themselves, you can give them a nice little interface. You say, here's, here's a job. If you hit run, uh, then, then it runs the process. Uh, another one that, that is really useful when you're running your scripts this way in Jenkins, uh, you, you get this nice uh, log that, that you can always come back to. You, you, basically, every run, uh, the logs are stored indefinitely by default, but you can set a retention policy, as you saw we did um, for, for one of our jobs. But, but that can be really useful if you are trying to debug because you can share a link. You can say, hey, that last you know, uh, piece of automation failed. I'm not sure why. Here's a link to the, the log. Uh, and then also, it allows you to keep a history of who and what. So when, you, when someone executes a job, uh, that, you know, that history of who executed that is, is stored. And if, if you have parameters in that job or that pipeline, uh, that is also stored. So you have this nice sort of little audit trail of who has done what. But uh, I, do keep in mind if you if if that is a strategy you want to use, uh, keep the retention thing in mind, and also keep storage in mind because, as, as you imagine, you know, un, if you leave that unbounded, then your log storage can become an issue. Uh, the the other uh, another use case for Jenkins is for continuous integration. I've already talked about this a little bit, and and you saw that in some of the examples that I've uh, been showing. Uh, but big thing, you can execute your unit tests with Jenkins. You can execute your end-to-end -end tests, so you can do things like stand up your application. Uh, you can have those end-to-end -end tests living in the same code base or uh, in, a, in a separate code base, and you can get both of those uh, pulled in to your automation. Uh, you can do static analysis with Jenkins, so things like uh, if you're a Python developer, uh, Flake 8, if you're a Java developer, things like find bugs or uh, something that's generally useful to everybody. Uh, there's a tool called SonarCube that uh, I'm quite fond of. And then um, one interesting aspect of using Jenkins for continuous integration 
you, you can both look at pull requests, uh, so looking at changes as they're coming in and making sure that those changes meet your standards, making sure you know that they don't break uh, f existing functionality, making sure that they pass whatever standards you, you might set in your, your static analysis if you're doing that. Uh, but you can also use them for long-loaded branches. So you can do things like every time master is updated, uh, run some analysis on it and keep a history of you know, whether your um, code coverage is going up or down. You can also use Jenkins for continuous delivery which delivery for, for different teams means different things. So for some folks, uh, delivery means doing builds. So uh, if, you, if you're doing builds of an application that's cross-platform, uh, you might have, for example, RPMs that you build and you might have EXE installers. So both of those things uh, could be built with the same uh, underlying automation code. Uh, once you have whatever artifacts you're building, um, you can automate pushing those out to, to a CDN or to whatever sort of internal location uh, to artifact repository. And you can also automate the deployment of a service. So you might use something like Ansible uh, to actually automate the, the, the deployment itself. And then you can use Jenkins as a way to invoke Ansible. Um, and, and so putting those two together, you can kind of see, you can, you can, you can kind of get the idea that you can build out a really long uh, pipeline where, where you go from, you know, a change has happened, <coughs> someone opened a PR, all the way through to you, you have the service running. And uh, I think, you know, that, that's the kind of thing that people strive for, but you know, even if you're just automating uh, just that deployment, that last step, if, if it, that's still valuable. And I think it's sort of a continuous journey. Uh, so quick recap. Uh, so Jenkins can be used for a lot of different kinds of automation. Uh, and if you take nothing else away, uh, I, I hope that you go away with... Um, you know, just some ideas of, of how you, you might use Jenkins. Um, plugins will, will give you additional functionality. Uh, the nodes are important because they provide some security and isolation and also allow you to do things like uh, have Windows builds if you're in a, a Linux environment and you have a box that you do your Windows builds on, you can uh, use that through Jenkins. And a uh, big one, so, I showed both the freestyle jobs and the pipelines. Uh, the big thing is that if you're starting new automation, uh, you, you should really look at pipelines because that's the direction that the Jenkins community is headed in. Uh, it's not that freestyle jobs are going away, but uh, pipelines are, are definitely getting the most attention right now. Uh, I have a few resources and uh, I'm going to make these, this presentation available. It's actually already available now. You, you might have seen um, the, the URL. I'm going to share that in a moment. But um, the Jenkins website has fantastic documentation for, for general Jenkins. There's a little bit of a, a learning curve um, to that documentation as I, I don't know if any of you were in the other Jenkins presentation the other day, but the speaker there did point out you know, there is a bit of a learning curve. So if you go to the Jenkins documentation, you think, oh, God, I, you know. I'm not understanding any of this. It's, it's not just you. Um, there, there's, there's a bit of a hump to get over. Um, the, the job DSL, uh, there, there's some various links related to that here. Um, and, and then I've posted some other you know, examples. Uh, I pasted a few links to the actual Jenkins files and uh, jobs that uh, we are using today. All right, um, so, so that's about all I have. Um, so if you have questions, uh, feel free to speak up. Uh, before that, uh, th thanks everybody for attending. I have a couple of links on here. Uh, the first one is the, this presentation. Um, so if you have QR code reader, you can get that, or the bit.ly link is somewhat short. Uh, second link. Um, uh, I would like uh, anyone that's willing to, if you'd like to give me some feedback, 
Uh, I'd love to know, you know, any suggestions for, for um, doing better on this talk, any other topics you'd want to hear more about in Jenkins, any of that. Any, any feedback is, is good, really. <laughs> so, questions? You know, go to a web page, fill out a form, and have it basically run a script for you. Uh, but one question I did have actually was uh, in terms of like Jenkins' argument. Like when you we have a Jenkins job, right? And you have the 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 job form and it's filling out, right? Um, right now, it seems that at least the way I've maybe we talk about this later, but uh, it uses environment variables to like pass the arguments kind of into the job, or that just seems to be the way it's done. Is there a better way of doing it? I, I'm not a big fan of like passing around environment variables all over the place and then having to like shuffle those into your actual use cases. So, yeah. So the the big thing, uh, you know, Barry just mentioned that if you put parameters on a job or on a pipeline. Uh, those end up in the execution context as environment variables. And so he was asking, you know, well, that seems sort of inconvenient. There are use cases that that's not really any fun. Um, so I would advise actually look at credentials as, as a way of resolving that because, you know, if the thing that you're trying to inject, say, is maybe a configuration, uh, if, if, if what you were going to end up doing with that anyways is building a configuration file, well, you can just stick the configuration file in Jenkins as a credential and then inject that. Um, and I guess what I was more looking for was something. I, I talked loud enough that that mic could probably hear me. No, it's like one of the audio box there. If I can't hear you, you can't hear me. Oh, uh, I guess what I was more looking for was something. Like, yeah, you're right, uh, but uh, w w whether, well, I really just wanted to like give me the arguments in uh, JSON or YAML format, <laughs> and then be able to just parse them myself, right? As opposed to like, right? And that and way you can have like, you know. So I have seen, um, I've seen some examples of passing an entire, you know, JSON string as an environment variable, and then later on in the job, doing some parsing of that, you know, in a Python script or Ruby script or what have you. Yeah. Um, Unfortunately, that's just sort of the, the, the mechanism that is used for passing parameters in Jenkins is the environment variable. So you can do things to kind of, you know, work around that, but there, there's no getting around that that's just the way that the parameters work. Yeah, actually, I launched one earlier today with uh, Podman. What, was was there a specific thing you wanted to see in a live Jenkins? Yeah, so so um, as I mentioned, you get a web UI, and that's on port eighty eighty. So when, when you first install Jenkins, what you'll get is, is you'll get an initial administrator password, and then it asks you to create a user. So I will yeah. log out yeah. and log back in. So it's a, a pretty typical web app. You know, you've got login. You've got uh, some user management in here. Um, so if I go, for example, to security, There are several ways to in integrate users with Jenkins. One of them, as, as I mentioned before, is to integrate with an LDAP database, which is useful if you're in an organization that already has that kind of thing s stood up. But if you're experimenting or you, you just want to set up something independent of that, um, Jenkins ha has its own uh, user database that you can use. 
Uh, you can create new users. Uh, always forget where the, the actual create new user uh, bit is. Yeah, people, thank you. <laughs> and then, unfortunately, one thing I actually am not a huge fan of is a lot of things in Jenkins are in this sort of side menu. Uh, is it new view here? Yeah. And I actually wonder if, if the user that I created initially doesn't actually have admin. So I'll log in as admin real quick. Actually, so, so funny thing about the admin user, um, there's this big long string that they give you when you install Jenkins. And I'd have to go dig that string out if I wanted to log in as admin. Well, it's all under Manage Jenkins. Whoops. And I, and I believe it is actually under Global Security. I just don't recall how to add a new. You can do this. You can check the checkbox and allow people to create their own user. Um, and I believe if I had logged in with the uh, admin user, which I'm not going to go dig out the, the the credential for that at the moment, but I think if I had logged in as the admin user, I would have had another menu item here for creating users. Go ahead. You had said that it hooks into like cloud resources and OpenStack. Do you know of any other hypervisors that it could hook into? Because I'm looking at uh, essentially using Packer to build images, and it's going to need essentially bare metal performance or bare metal to enable it. So I've already got it to where I passed through the CPU to allow um, whatever it, is. it essentially exposes the CPU to the VM. Um, so I was curious if you know, does it work? Do you just like install the agent on the VM? Yeah, so, so there are a few ways to get agents running. Uh, the, the most straightforward one is the SSH one, and most people are familiar with SSH and have machines that they can SSH into. But one thing you can also do, you can launch the Jenkins agent and point it back at the Jenkins server. Um, so it's almost the other way around. Um, if you're using uh, you know, hypervisor like VMware, there, there is a plugin for that. Um, as, as I said before, if I'm surprised when Jenkins doesn't have a plugin for, for some, uh, especially infrastructure or platform related service. Um, so, so for example, if I go here, manage Jenkins, and then go to plugins, available, So there are seven matches. Uh, yeah, yeah, they've they've done a lot in Jenkins. Uh, one thing I didn't mention, but is is useful to know. When you come to this uh, front page, uh, they they have an area here where they'll, where they'll display if you have you know plugins that are outdated with known vulnerabilities. If you go to manage Jenkins, there's a whole slew that will show up here if you have uh, stale data or if you ha have uh, known vulnerabilities. Yeah. Any other questions? What's that? Have you seen Brent, Brent, Brent Placider's book on Jenkins? I, I have not, actually. Um, most of my experience with Jenkins has been um, sort of self-learning. Uh, I've, I've used it. So honestly, ever since uh, 
I started at Red Hat a little more than five years ago. I, I was on an IT team that used Jenkins pretty heavily. Um, started building out some pipelines with the freestyle jobs uh, and then have continued to do Jenkins work um, since then. And the, the tricky thing I would say about any sort of um, books is that Jenkins is, is evolving very, very quickly. Um, so the, the pipeline thing is, is somewhat newer and if you, if you talk with someone about Jenkins, they may or may not even know about the, the pipeline thing. They, they may think about the pattern uh, of chaining jobs together and, and that might not be what they think of when you say pipeline. Um, the, the UI is also um, going through an, an overhaul. There's, there's a project called Blue Ocean. So even you know, the UI that I've shown you um, may not be there for you know, forever. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? So this is a, a very basic uh, setup. I did import a couple things uh, into it, but I kind of stubbed them out afterwards. Um, so I, I will, I can talk through a couple things though. So, so when you do new item, as I mentioned, there's freestyle job as an option. There's also um, pipeline as an option. And these are both, you know, you go through the UI and you define what you want it to do. So pipeline, you could either tell it to, to check out a script uh, from a repo or you could paste in the, the pipeline code itself. Um, the option, one option that we've been using a lot lately that's quite nice is this multi-branch pipeline. So what this does is if you have code out on GitHub for some project that has a Jenkins file in the repo, uh, this will, will scan all of the branches of that particular project, you know, you configure it, um, and then it will execute the, the pipeline for each of the branches as they, as they have changes. And you can define rules on what uh, branches it should be operating on. You can um, define, define rules about whether it should build PRs or not, whether it should just build branches, whether you want to build PRs from external forks or um, just you know, PRs from, the, from that repo itself. But um, as I said, I did spin up a couple real, real quick here. I was, I was mainly using these as uh, an aid to get some screenshots. But um, you can see here, I pointed it at, the, at this project that we've been working on. Um, and all I had to do uh, with, with this multi-branch setup is tell it, I want to look at this organization, and then I had to give it a repo. And then with those two pieces of information, I, I think I left pretty much everything else default. With that and the Jenkins file in the repo, that's enough to get it to go out and, and um, examine the branches that are out there. Uh, and it, it will also examine the PRs. And then, like I said, it will um, execute the, the pipeline for each of the branches and each of the PRs, uh, with the caveat being that Know, it'll take into account any uh, rules that you've set on what branches it should look at. Um, the freestyle job, uh, that one's also pipeline. But freestyle job, I can I can spin one up right now. Um, you know, because why not? So it can be as simple as. I've got a shell script that I want to run, and I can skip all these other options and just say, let me run a shell, and I want to, I'm not going to do anything fancy, uh, I just type date there, so it, all it's going to do is run the date command, and then the output of the job will just be the date, so if I hit build now, I can then go in, and you can see uh, I'll blow it up anyways. You can see I've got this uh, date command that's been executed. Uh, I, I, like I mentioned before, you know, you can you can take this link. Uh, kind of hard to see there, but you can take this link and you can send it to anyone else who um, 
you know, can reach that Jenkins server and they can, they can see the same logs. Uh, you can send them the job and if you have authorized them to access Jenkins, they can hit that build now button and do the same thing that you just did. So you can start to imagine, you know, you put some scripts in there that perform some processes and you've, you're, you don't have to necessarily run those scripts anymore. You know, you can have, you know, even a manager who doesn't want to or can't, doesn't feel comfortable with writing code, they, get, they can then, you know, run those same scripts. Um, another quick thing I can show, I mentioned parameters. If you have a script that say, uh, I'll just throw in a parameter called foo. And I'll say echo foo for sim simplicity. So now when I hit build, I get a page that asks me to put in some parameters. So now I have a parameter for foo. And if I put in uh, hello self and then hit build on that now, I'm executing, you know, a script with with an argument to it, and yep. So they become environment variables. They get yeah. That yeah. Um. So so yeah, I think the freestyle job is actually much more approachable than uh, pipelines just to kind of get started with, but. Like I said before, uh, if, if you're starting like a new automation project, uh, you should def definitely consider starting with pipelines because that is the, the strategy, the syntax that the community is pushing forward. Yeah, so a uh, question for anyone either watching later or streaming uh, was, do I have any recommendations for setting up Jenkins securely? Um, so I would say the, the biggest thing is don't, if you can help it, run Jenkins in a publicly accessible location. Um, there, there are folks that do, um, and I, I cringe when I, I hear about it because basically, you know, your Jenkins server is, is a machine that has some sort of shell access that, as you've seen, is pretty, you know, pretty easy to go in there and just play with, and um, so so there's that first. Second thing is you know, and, and it's going to kind of depend on your use case, but if you can use an uh, an existing, you know, LDAP, for example, if you can use LDAP in your organization, you can then restrict uh, that Jenkins server to. to say perhaps an LDAP group or maybe a few individuals, um, it really starts there. Um, the, the other thing is that uh, like, like, like you do generally for an application, um, don't create uh, overprivileged processes if you can help it. So if you can avoid having your, your Jenkins master being able to sudo on nodes, that's helpful. Um, Running inside of uh, ephemeral compute resources is nice because you don't have a box that's just sitting out there that someone can just SSH into at any time of the day. Um, but I, to be honest, I think you know um, someone with. I, th I think that that c could be its own presentation, and uh, I do do have some thoughts, but I'm by no means an expert on hardening Jenkins. Yeah. Any other questions? Anybody? Okay, so the question was, is there an interactive shell within Jenkins? Yes, but not what you're thinking about. So if you go to manage Jenkins, there is a script console. This script console runs Groovy scripts and these run in the context of the Jenkins master. So you can introspect things in Jenkins and anybody that has administrative access has a lot of power through this. Basically, you know, going back to the security point, um, 
giving someone administrative access is very scary because they, you know, you can do things like go into the credential store and extract credentials and just pipe them out somewhere. Uh, you, you can do things like, uh, I had a little fun with this once. Um, we had some IRC notifications. You can, you know, send it IRC messages as Jenkins, you know, things like that. So everything gets run as what, what you set up to SSHNS. So I would suggest uh, creating a Jenkins user that has some limited privileges. And then if you, you need to run in the context of another user, you know you can use uh, sudo for that. Um, you, you could also define uh, different users. There's nothing stopping you from saying, I, I want to run as, as a user you know, um, as, as some other user with le less privileges. There, there's a lot of freedom in, in how you actually set up Jenkins. So, yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the kind of thing you could definitely think of a million ways to, to accomplish what you're, what you're trying to do. Um, yeah. All right. Um, well, thanks again, everyone. Uh, I, as I said, uh, any feedback you have for me is much appreciated. Uh, this presentation is, is actually, as of this morning, available online. Uh, I've got a QR code and link there. Um, but you can also just go to kahowl.net and go to presentations, and, and it'll be there if you'd like to, to view it later. All right. Thanks, everybody. actually have a vagrant image that we spin up a Jenkins server and we do our development of new jobs or pipelines against that rather than running them against you know the production Jenkins server and that's uh, a good pattern because then you know you don't have people having you know bad mistakes on production